astray A stricter watch to keep And should I ever forget your way Restore your wandering sheep Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to another online worship broadcast brought to you by Cross Life Church. So glad to have you with us today, especially our new people who are with us. We are talking politics and religion in our series, Politics is Driving Me Crazy. And we're hearing some hope and encouragement from God and his word, and we'll do that again today. What I'd like to do is open up our worship with prayer. So I need you to join me after I say, thank you, Jesus, you say, your grace finds me. Let's pray. Good morning, Jesus, on this new day you have made to bless me and the rest of the world. Thank you, Jesus. Without you, Jesus, I am lost in sin, in unbelief, and in trusting in myself way too much. Your mercy saves me and forgives me. Thank you, Jesus. Your death and resurrection, give me hope, Lord, that you use your power to save me, to help me, to change my life. Thank you, Jesus. I need your promises and the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that I understand your teaching and trust in your way more than my way. Speak your word to my soul today. Thank you, Jesus. I worship and praise you today, Jesus, my living and loving Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Please now join in the song, Your Grace Finds Me. It's there in the newborn cry There in the light of every sunrise There in the shadows of this life Your great grace It's there on the mountain top There in the everyday and the mundane There in the sorrow and the dancing Your great grace Oh such grace From the creation to the cross There from the cross into eternity your grace finds me Yes, your grace finds me It's there on the wedding day There in the weeping by the graveside there in the very breath we breathe Your great grace The same for the rich and poor The same for the saint and for the sinner Enough for this whole wide world Your great grace no such grace from the creation. 
salvation to the cross There from the cross into eternity Your grace finds me Yes, your grace finds me There in the darkest night of the soul There in the sweetest songs of victory Your grace finds me Yes, your grace finds me Your great grace Oh, such grace Your great grace Oh, such grace Oh, So I'm breathing in your grace and breathing out your praise. Yeah, I'm breathing in your grace. Forever I'll be breathing in your grace and breathing out your praise. I'm breathing in your grace. Forever I'll be breathing in your grace and It's so good to worship together, even online. And one of the things you can do to enhance that togetherness with others is go to our website, crosslifepf.org. And there you can click on connection card. And that simply lets us know that you're worshiping with us today and connects you with all the other worshipers. If you're new here, uh, I would really encourage you to use a connection card and to submit prayer requests as part of that connection card. I would love to pray for you. Those come right to me. Our prayer team would love to pray for you too. Also, during today's broadcast, if you can go on your Facebook page and post on there a check-in, and that check-in says, Honor God and Government, Matthew 22. That'll be our topic for today. If you are a veteran participating in our worship broadcast today, please know that we thank you for your service to our country. We know the sacrifices that veterans have made, and we want to express our appreciation to you by this video today that says, God bless you, veterans. There are sons and daughters, our mothers and fathers, our grandparents, neighbors, and friends. They served in a thousand different ways in places spanning the globe, watching, waiting, and ready at a moment's notice to give what was asked of them. So now we pause to express our gratitude and love toward those who served. Each swore a sacred oath to protect, and each bravely stood in our place around the world, all so that we could stand secure in the land of the free. Words like sacrifice, honor, commitment, integrity, bravery, and courage hardly scratch the surface of our gratitude for their service. While our words fail against the enormity of expressing our thanks for all you've done, 
we still raise our voices and honor you in our hearts, which are filled with the deepest kind of gratitude. To all of you, we pause to say, God bless you. And thank you for your service. Please go to our website, crosslifepf.org. You can submit a connection card there and also give online to support this ministry and producing these webcasts. We'll give you a couple moments to do that and I'll be back to preach today's message. Welcome to part three of our series, Politics is Driving Me Crazy, and what an opportune time, considering the election of the President of the United States and others, to consider these words of Jesus that guide our way in this country, for now and for all time. So listen to this from Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 15, as Jesus interacts with the Pharisees. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is God's word. So you're trapped and you need to find a way out. It began as a fun trip with some friends to Costa Rica and you thought you would go out for an afternoon jungle hike and exploring some caves and you make it to the back of a cave, and when you're in the back of the dark cave with your friends, you hear this rumbling sound. It's maybe a growl, and you turn, and you're face to face with an angry gorilla. He's blocking the entrance to the cave. But there is also a gate at the back of the cave going into what looks like an open cave on the other side, although that gate is locked. Now what? Well, 
in your group of friends, there happens to be a martial arts expert ninja warrior who brought a sword. Oh, that's always nice to have a ninja with you. And there happens to be a locksmith in your group also who notices that there's a pile of keys on the ground of the cave and surely one of them unlocks the gate. So, how do you get out? Kids, are you paying attention to this? This is a riddle. How do you get out of the cave? Well, let's explore some options. We could have the ninja look for the key to use in the door. Well, that wouldn't make sense for the ninja to look for the key. We could have the person who's a locksmith grab the sword and try to fight the gorilla. Well, that wouldn't make sense either for a locksmith to use a sword. All right, so hey, how about if we have the ninja use his sword against the gorilla? Well, you know, you make this gorilla mad. He, uh, I don't know if a ninja with a sword could take out a gorilla, and what if there's another gorilla or more? That could end the lives of everyone in the group. So, yeah, that maybe won't work. Okay, well, let's have the locksmith find the right key because he knows what keys are he can do it quickly and unlock the gate. Well, he could do that, but that's going to take a little while, and that gorilla is angry and hungry. None of those four options are going to work. Here's the only option that will work. This is how you get out of the cave. The ninja brandishes his sword against the gorilla, careful not to make him too angry so that he attacks or calls his friends, just to stall him long enough so that the locksmith can find a key, use the key to open the gate. You decide as a group to try that, and it works. You go through the gate, lock it behind you, the gorilla can't chase you, and you found your way to freedom. (laughs) That right there could be a story for uh, teaching organizational leadership. It could be a story that a coach uses with his team to instruct them about teamwork. But it really is a story that illustrates the biblical teaching that Jesus gives us here in Matthew 22, the biblical teaching of the separation of church and state, how Christians and the government relate to each other. We call that the separation of church and state. So, Let me unravel that a little bit using some key Bible verses that teach this Bible teaching, this doctrine. So let's begin with this, that God has given the power of the sword to the government. And that power of the sword is the the use of law, the threat of punishment, and force that makes people comply with the laws of the land. That's what a sword does. So the Bible says in Romans 13, rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities. And God has given the power of the keys to the church, to all Christians. That power of the keys being the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can unlock a heart that is bound by sin or unbelief. So, there's these two institutions, the sword and the keys. Some Bible verses for the church that talk about the church's use of the keys. Jesus once said, I will give you, he's speaking to Christians, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Two different tools. A sword and keys. You do not use the sword to unlock the gate. And you do not use keys to fight off a gorilla. They, they don't work for those roles. They are intended for the purpose that that the tool is made for, designed for. Same thing for the government and for Christians, for the church. And so the government is not intended by God to force people into faith. And the church is not intended by God to rule with force. But when each does its own job, separately, they can actually cooperate in a wonderful way. Let's pause for a second, and I just want to ask, what does it look like when Christians, when Christians improperly, have improper expectations for this truth? 
So let me give you a couple examples. One, one improper expectation of the relationship between church and government, church and state, is that Christians would use the power of government to criminalize all sin. We would vote uh, uh, leaders into place who would make laws that greed is punishable by a fine or by imprisonment or maybe by death. That anger is punishable. That any sin is punishable and it's a criminal act. That would be an improper use. Uh, improper roles. Another one would be uh, Christians using the power of government to force people to worship God or to force people to pray to the true God. That's a mixed use of God's intent. This also happens when Christians, well-meaning Christians, imply that there is a candidate for election that is a, the Christian choice, that, like that's God's candidate or even a political platform that, that some Christians somehow define as the Christian platform and the other one isn't. Improper, mixed use of God's intent for church and state. Finally, it would be uh, Christians improperly using it would be refusing to honor, respect, and obey a government official because that official isn't Christian enough for that Christian to obey. That would be wrong and a misuse of God's intent and design for the sword and for the keys. So if you're new to Christianity, if you're exploring Jesus, I want to say something to you right now, and and this is really important, because Christians don't always get this right, and you might have the wrong impression. And I want to tell you this. When you're a Christian, you do not have to be a certain political party or persuasion to be a good Christian. I know good Christians who are Democrats. I know good Christians who are Republicans. I know good Christians who are neither. And God doesn't demand a certain political persuasion. He simply demands that the government do its job of keeping peace and order using force. If you think that a Democrat does that better than a Republican, as a good Christian, you can support that platform if you think that a republic. So there's, there's ways that we go about uh, supporting and honoring the government to do the job that God gave it. And the job that God gave government is not to be Christian, but to keep the order. If you're a veteran Christian, I have this request for you. Please stop criticizing political platforms that, that are meant for government, not for church, as if that they, they aren't Christian enough for Christians to support. Be very careful there, defining it in your way that you say is that, that the entire platform for some reason is not Christian. There may be pieces of it that don't align with the will of God. Those pieces we can compare to the word of God, but the entire political platform might simply be one that because it's government, it doesn't have to be church. It can be one that is appropriate for our society. So, Jesus has a word for Christians or church people who want to condemn others for having an opinion in a, in a government-minded way that they say is not Christian. And he says the word right here in Matthew 22, verse 18, hypocrites. And he tells us, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So, During Jesus' day, Caesar, the emperor of the Roman Empire, was a pagan ruler who actually claimed that he had divine powers. So not only is he pagan, but he's trying to take Jesus' job. And and Jesus is saying in these words that even the Son of God is bound by the design of God to respect, honor, and obey Caesar. Interestingly, three days after Jesus spoke these words here in Matthew 22, this is Holy Week. This is Tuesday of Holy Week. Three days later, Caesar, the pagan ruler who claimed divine powers, his government, led locally by the governor Pontius Pilate, condemned Jesus to death and crucified him. Why didn't Jesus revolt? 
Jesus, I mean, if he's truly the son of God, why didn't he call down angels? Why didn't he stop this from happening? Two reasons that Jesus didn't do that. Two reasons Jesus didn't revolt. Number one, trust. And number two, love. Let me quickly explore those two. Trust. Jesus trusted in his father's authority over all other authority, over all government, including Caesar and Pontius Pilate, who presided over the trial that condemned Jesus to be crucified to death. As you become familiar with the Gospels and you, and you read about this, you see that it was Jesus' firm faith in his Father that allowed him to endure the excruciating whipping the pain, the beatings, the carrying his cross, the crucifixion itself, that it was his faith in his Father from the Garden of Gethsemane to the, his death on the cross that allowed him to endure such excruciating pain and persecution. We know this because during, while it was happening, Jesus made certain statements. Here's a statement that Jesus made to Pontius Pilate when he was on trial before Pilate and Pilate was going to put Jesus to death. Jesus said to him in John 19, verse 11, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus' faith in his Father helped him to endure. Secondly, Jesus didn't revolt because of love. Jesus loved you enough to restrain his power so that he would die. And he died for your sins. Jesus loved you enough to become this, this sacrifice, this substitutionary sacrifice that gave his perfect life to satisfy God's demands of justice and holiness for sin and to make it count for you. Now, epic turnaround, three days later, after Jesus died, epic turnaround. Jesus, who had submitted to government authorities, who had allowed them to kill him, Jesus used all his power to rise from the dead and to overpower every authority in this world, sin, death, the devil, and all governments. The Roman soldiers positioned at the tomb could not keep Jesus inside. The Roman <laughs> empire that condemned Jesus to death couldn't keep him dead. Even the Roman Empire that persecuted early Christian believers after Jesus ascended up into heaven and the early church, even th those Roman persecutions didn't squash the church. And governments today in Pakistan, China, United States, in any nation cannot, cannot conquer the power of Christianity and the faith and the love that we have, faith in our Father and love for Jesus, they can't take it away. So let me ask you, would you like more peace during a, a time that, a, a, of chaos and crisis really in our country as we're seeking to come to grips as a nation with our president and, and who it is and to rally behind him with unity and harmony. Would, would you like some, some peace in this moment? Would you like some hope? Hope that the economy is not the most powerful influence over your business or your career or your retirement or your family plans. Would you like some hope? How about some encouragement? Some encouragement for us as Christians that no matter no matter what government, no matter what country you live in, any government anywhere, that Christianity will never be marginalized and will never disappear on this planet because God has promised it and Jesus has all authority. You want that? Then three things. Like Jesus trusted in his Father, trust in God the Father and his authority that is over all other authorities in this world. And trust in a promise like this one from Romans 8, neither the present nor the future nor any powers will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Secondly, love Jesus enough like, like he loved you. And love Jesus enough to submit to and to honor and to obey government authority that you may not love that government authority, 
But because you love Jesus, who is over them, you will honor and obey and submit to them too. And thirdly, I invite you to stick around for our crosstalk today. Because during that time, I'm going to unpack a little more of this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees and the Herodians, and we're going to look at that coin and what it represents and why Jesus' answer is so perfect that he gave to them. And it allows you some talking points and some peace and some hope and some encouragement during these days. So, let me say a prayer, and we'll continue with children's message and crosstalk. Let's pray. God, I'm thinking today of of two groups of people. I'm thinking, Lord, of of veteran Christians who have been Christians for years and have held political views and values for years that they align with Christianity. And God, I'm one of them, and I pray that that those who are joining me in this prayer, and I, I pray that I can too, Lord, make sure that I grow in my understanding of your purposes and plans for church, for Christians, and for government and that they are different. And that we would enjoy the freedom that we have as your people, God, to make wise choices when it comes to government leaders whom we are not electing as pastors or priests or teachers or missionaries or elders of the church, but as government rulers. God, I pray also today for for new believers, for those who are curious about Jesus Christ and Christianity. Lord, may may our light as veteran Christians, may may it shine on the way for them. And may these new believers, God, may they put their trust in Jesus as the ultimate authority. And may that trust bring them hope, bring them peace, and bring them encouragement beginning this week and forever. I pray these things, God, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Kids, gather around for the children's message. I'm going to come back with some money, and I'm going to ask you how I should use it. All right, kids, I got it. I I have the money here. Now the question is, what do we do with this money? I have one, two, three, four, five million dollars. Well, okay, I just have five dollars. But if you had five dollars, what would you do with it? I have some ideas. So I'm going to give the idea what we should do with some of this money. And when I give you the idea, I want you either to say, yay, or I want you to say, Boo, if you like it or don't like it. All right, so here we go. The first dollar, I think, should go to savings. You can't use it. You save it for later. All right, yeah, I I like that one. Let's put one dollar in there. All right, that goes to savings. Next, oh, spending. How many, we have four dollars left. How many should we put in spending? Mm, I'm going to put two dollars in spending. Do you like that? Two? A little more? Okay. I have two dollars left. Two left. I'm going to put one of my five dollars in church and charity. That, what do you think of that? Okay. Now, if you are an average American who had five dollars, One of those dollars must, this isn't even a choice that you have, if you live in the United States, one of those dollars, roughly, would need to go to taxes. What do you think of that? Let's put that in taxes, and that goes to the government. And some of you might have been saying, boo, don't pay taxes. But guess what? Taxes go to our government. And that allows them to do things like make roads and have police officers and even schools and teachers. So the government needs taxes so that they can do their work. And guess who tells us to pay taxes? Not just the government. Jesus teaches us to pay taxes. So this was a verse from today's message in Matthew chapter 22 where Jesus says, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. He's the government ruler. 
Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So Jesus tells us to pay taxes, and so we will. And when we do, we can cheer because we're doing what Jesus wants us to do. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your direction and your teaching. Thank you for blessing us with money. We pray we use it appropriately for your glory, including paying taxes. We pray for our government, Jesus, that they would use taxes appropriately to keep peace in order and take care of us. And all God's people said, amen. Please join us in this last song. It's a beautiful song about God's promises always being true. We'll sing, I will trust in you. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I try to win this war. We're not done yet. Please continue with us in crosstalk as I explore Matthew chapter 22 and Jesus' words a bit more and apply them to how government and church work together today. Open your Zoom app and join us there. I'll see you in a minute.